And in taking over the control of the body, the mind then affirmed a leadership over this structure. And this leadership ultimately uh, caused the individual uh, to become a mental being rather than a living thing solely. This mental being then assumed the control or leadership of all the processes of the body, causing these processes to unfold, causing the evolutionary concept to take over, because it was mind controlling matter that equaled growth. Growth in this sense merely not the extension of body, not the continual healthy life of the cell, not even the healthy process of cell fission and a multiplication of cells by means of which the world might sometime become completely laden with tissue alone. But now the gradual imposing of mental purpose, the, the imposing of mental energy upon physical processes and upon the life itself by which these processes were animated. Thus the mind became the transformer. It transformed body into a purposed instrument of selfness. And gradually this self in the body attained greater and greater dominion of body until it established a complete tyranny over body. By the time this had been achieved, man had become a thinking creature. <coughs> But now we are at this interesting crossroad in the world's thought that we have now achieved the condition in which by evolutionary processes uh, in nature and by psychological processes in man, the neural power, the nerve distribution has become the administrator of life. It is therefore in the nervous system now uh, that we must seek the solution to most of life's mysteries. It is in the nervous system also we must find the cause of most of life's misfortunes. It is in the nervous system also that we must search for life's meanings, life's goals, life's purposes. We must also seek in the processes of the laws governing the development of neural energy and its distribution to discover the rules by means of which mind does administer matter, either correctly or incorrectly. We thus find man today, uh, as the ancients rather assumed him to be, a creature largely composed of mind and the mind physical symbolism, the nervous system. We find that the nervous system has permeated practically all parts of human structure. That as a result of this, this structure is becoming increasingly sensitive and immediately responsive. And by this process, whether we realize it or not, the entire body is being changed into mind. Mind is gradually becoming uh, the substance of man. And the so-called uh, arterial or physical system of man is becoming more and more an energizer of mind. And the vital substances of the body are being channeled ever more continuously uh, to the use of the mental agent. Now this sounds as though we were progressing in some direction or another. But the rub in this situation seems to be that no one seems to be able to vouch uh, completely and adequately for the integrity of this mind instrument that has taken over. Just exactly what is this mind? What is its real nature? What is its substance? Is the mind essentially good? Modern psychology and modern science would be inclined to doubt that the mind is good. They will not go much further than to simply say, here it is. We got it. We've used it. We've abused it. 
And here we are, in the midst of the consequence of something. Also, we suddenly discover that practically all human beings are trusting their destinies to an instrument called the mind, without knowing where it came from, what it is trying to do, whether it is selfish or unselfish, right or wrong, whether it is capable of factuality or not, whether we can depend upon its advice or cannot depend upon it, whether it is an arbitrary despot or an instrument of universal destiny, we do not know. We take certain comfort and consolation, however, in the assumption that mind must be meaningful because it is a product of a meaningful universe engaged in a meaningful project. Therefore, mind must have its place in the universal purpose or it could not appear in the human structure. For all intents and purposes, however, man has discovered uh, that the mind, by its very nature, derives a large part of its knowledge or a large part of its basic reasoning material as a result of the testimonies of the nerve sensory perceptions. Therefore, that the mind very largely is building its entire structure from environment, and that the great and essential purpose of mind was to extend itself by means of nerves, so that by means of these nerve links it could bind itself to the mystery of the outer world. Without a nervous system, man could not be aware of the world around him. Therefore, the nervous system has given him the tremendous instrument of contact. Contact with phenomena. Contact with all the innumerable diversities of activities with which we have gradually become familiar. For all classifications, all orders, all systems, uh, which have now been brought together to constitute basic texts for education. All of these structures of findings are the direct result of nerve testimony. By means of nerves, certain impressions, certain uh, reflections have been brought into the nature. Thus, out of this entire structure of nerves, Man is building a series of adjustments between the self, which is the nerve focus, and the world in which the complete organism exists. In this particular pattern of things, the heart has been reduced to one simple problem, namely that it supplies the fuel. The human heart becomes simply the energy by means of which this entire procedure is carried on. If the heart stops, the entire nervous system fails with it. If anything happens to the essential life principle in man, all of the vast uh, superstructure of nervous reflex is destroyed. Therefore, the nervous system and the egoism in man is dependent upon the heart. This dependency, however, has not been generally recognized. And uh, the individual, except for a few who have made certain careful studies, the individual in general affirms that the mind, being his link with his world, is his most valued possession and that also its testimonies, right or wrong, good or bad, are inevitable, and that we should only pause long enough to be thankful for the fact that we have a mind and should not be much concerned with what we do about it. Now, this prevailing thankfulness is also generally absent, and as a result, we are rather thoughtless people so far as major problems are concerned. About the second century of the Christian era in Asia, there arose uh, a sect in Buddhism which was centered around what was called the Lotus Gospel. The Lotus Gospel, possibly the result of the work of the great Buddhist Ahat, Navajuna. 
certainly one of the greatest saints and reformers of primitive Buddhism, centered around what was called the heart doctrine. The fact that the truth of things must be obtained by restoring the sovereignty of life to the heart. Now, the uh, Bible too gives us much the same thing, thing. As a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That the real person, the real nature of things, resides in the heart. That the heart is therefore the silent one. That power which is generally ignored, but which alone contains the fountain of things. Uh, Nagarjuna took the attitude that by means of the heart we are bound to the world of cause. By means of the nerves of the mind we are bound to the world of effects. And at the moment in some way the truth in us is concealed by the conflict between these two systems and by the fact that largely the control of the body has come to be vested in the intellectual or neural system. Thus we have built a mental nature, built up upon phenomena, phenomena that has been digested, organized, and rationalized. It is as though we had a kind of a bureau of vital statistics in the skull. And into this bureau we have gathered all known and knowable facts. We have then turned these facts over to coordinators, who have in a mysterious and wonderful way, by aid of a machine, which is more exact than any of the mechanical brains we have ever been able to manufacture, that by means of this internal machine, which transforms facts into relationships, upon which dynamic must depend. But by means of this, we have come to certain dynamic attitudes about things. These dynamic attitudes form in themselves a little bouquet or cluster of dynamic factors. And these, in turn, by their chemistries and interminglings, have produced what we call the ego, which is, in a sense, the summary of our dynamics. The ego is therefore the thing that says, I want, I will, I must. Or in uh, more convenient terms, not having any particular desire for exercise, it says, I am. Which is the affirmation of the fact of self gained from one primary uh, means alone, namely, that the thinker distinguishes a difference between its own nature and that which it thinks about. Phenomenon, therefore, or the message of outside things moving in upon the individual, this procedure gradually affirms the existence of the thinker in relationship to its own thoughts. And by the fact that we see, we taste, we touch, we feel, the gradual inevitable conclusion is that we exist. And this positive concept of existence within the mind gradually becomes justified by the fact that we can extend our own consciousness into other things. Therefore, we must have a separate consciousness which can be so extended. And subconsciously, we have invested this with the dimensions and, pr and proportions of a psychic self or an entity. Now, in this procedure also, the nervous system has come into positive operation. And the nervous system, extending itself throughout the body, has formed its own kind of body. It is not merely that the nervous system is little threads uh, making other physical organs function. The nervous system, in order to uh, cause function to exist in 